All right. Um, so this is, a, we're just gonna kind of get to know your camera a little bit. Um, and this is something you can apply at home. I, I should have told you to bring your camera today so you can kind of look at it and follow along. But um, let's, uh, let's just talk about the different types of cameras. So if you're choosing a camera, you've got choices, right? Choosing a camera. And really one of the top choices these days is our phone technology has caught up a lot of ways with our cameras. So that's what you're spending a lot of money on when you buy a smartphone. You're spending a lot of money on the camera itself. Um, I'll show you something that we shot on a, just an iPhone XR or a 10R. Uh, we shot a lot. Uh, we did a little Star Wars video, and Jason, well, Jason, my son, did it all and did all the visual effects and everything. So I'll show you that. But most of the action sequences are on an iPhone, and. What, we basically just had a little tripod and we walked around. So the image stabilization, you guys know what image stabilization is? So when you shake it, you don't see that. It's, they, it smooths itself out. It's really nice. And so some of these action scenes are just with an iPhone and it looks awesome. But the problem with iPhones is you don't have a lot of focus control. You don't get the cool shots like pull focus, going from one actor to the other. So there's not a lot of depth of field. You have to kind of have to force the depth of field to make it interesting. But it's really great for, um, for action shots and moving around uh, and stuff like that. So camera phone is, how, uh, is probably the easiest way to label this. It's smartphone, usually smartphones come with a camera, but um, camera phone. All right, and then we've got a camcorder. Okay, and then we've got um, an action camera. This is a great way to call basically what a GoPro is. Yeah. So what are the some of the disadvantages of a GoPro? It sounds not very really good. Sounds usually not that great, but it, it, it makes works. Like it makes, yeah, so it has the, the fisheye effect, yeah? It doesn't have, it basically doesn't allow you to add any extensions to it, like a different microphone. A different yeah, lens. different lens or, yeah. Yeah, yeah just kind of like the limitation of an iPhone too, where you can't, you can't focus in, you can't zoom in and things like that. iPhone, you can zoom in digitally, but digital zoom is always terrible. Um, and you can, do, like with the new 11s and stuff, they have a telephoto lens, but it's either one or the other. You don't zoom into that, I don't think do but what were you gonna say um, you can't see what you're yeah yeah you don't really have a monitor you're just trusting that it's doing its job um, unless you're monitoring live on a separate system but most of the time you just kind of put it in place or you strap it to your wrist or something as you're doing something and and uh, and it works but yeah so there's not a lot of but it's great for actually you can throw it on a drone and you can get some awesome drone shots and things like that um, and it's pretty much indestructible too. <laughs> you can bring it anywhere. You, we filmed some stuff in the ocean. Uh, my sons went parasailing and they brought it up. And it just, you know, if you drop it, it's, it'll probably survive, but you probably lost it. But um, yeah, pretty indestructible. So action cameras, okay? Um, but yeah, that's one of the issues is, the main issue is bad sound, but there's not a lot of, not a lot of options either, okay? Um, and then we've got uh, what I'm calling an aerial camera. How do you spell aerial? Yeah. Aerial camera, or in other words, drones. Okay, and if you've priced out any drones, they're not that terrible. You can get a nice, you can get a decent drone for under 500 bucks, okay? And it's not like you need to be too picky on how those shots look. They're gonna look cool, whatever they are, because they're up in the air. Now before drones, they actually used helicopters. And so there would be cameramen inside of helicopters taking these shots, um, but now we have the flexibility of drones. Um, now drones are a little bit crazy because one time we went to go film a football game and as part of 
uh, one of our movies is called The High School Story and it's, football was a huge part of this uh, film, but we did some drone shots of the, of the actual game, but there was like three other drones flying around in the sky. So there's like territorial things with drones happening too. And they are um, trying to regulate drone usage, especially like in national parks. Like animals have gotten seriously injured from drone people trying to film like like uh, animals running and things like that. Um, so, yeah, and it's there's there needs to be a little bit more regulation. But those are drones; they're very uh, very handy. But um, most of the time, you would need a license. Okay. What else we've got? DSLR. So do you guys know what DSLR stands for? Yes. Um, going back to the drone thing, uh -huh. by a license, do you mean like the owner's permission of the land? You do need that, but a lot of times they're trying to regulate more. Like, do you have a license to pilot? You need a like oh. it's almost like a pilot's license okay. to pilot a drone. Um, so we did another shoot that that greatest toolman. We did a we did a flash mob thing the next year. And we did a, a downtown Golden during like uh, the Golden Buffalo Bill days, um, where people they shut down the streets and there's a bunch of shops and everybody. Well, we did a flash mob. Do you guys know what a flash mob is? So in the middle of everything, um, all of a sudden you hear this music and then people just start dancing. And that's what we did at, for the Be a Tool. The next summer we did a flash mob and we had a drone shot and it was pretty fun. Um, maybe I'll show you that, but. We did a couple drone shots down in Pueblo for this last film that we did, uh, Sleeper Agent. And we had permission, we had to get permission from the city to do it. Um, Cause you can put anything on a drone, unfortunately. <laughs> you could uh, get into places where you're not allowed to, you could put things in places where you're not allowed to go. And um, I mean, so it's sketchy what you could do with the drone if you really wanted to. So. They're trying to regulate it more, um, but for now, just if you are, if you have a drone, then you need to be respectful and to ask for permission and go through the proper channels. Um, so DSLR, does anyone know what DSLR stands for? I'm guessing D is digital. Yeah, so D, D is digital. And then SLR, so this is what it means, single lens reflex, okay? So um, that means that there's one lens. So when you're watching, when you're looking at what you're viewing in the viewfinder, you're seeing a mirrored image, like a mirror, like basically the image is reflected. Um, there's also a dual lens thing, which means that there's an, a lens so you can monitor what you're filming and then there's a separate lens doing the actual filming. Well, that's not cool because what if one lens is working and one isn't? You know, it's not an accurate representation of what you're actually filming. So a single lens reflex is nice because you can see what you're actually filming. So if there's a fly that lands on the lens, you know it. Um, so that's what a DSLR is, a digital single lens reflex. Now here's the deal with this, a digital single lens reflex. Here's the deal, here's the problems with a DSLR. Like they're nice. Like I have a Canon T3i and we I'll show you some of the shots that we filmed with that. But um, um, you can get really good depth of field, shallow depth of field, so you get that nice, cool, blurry background. They're very nice, they're nice cameras, but they have limited recording time. I think most of them are limited to 15 minutes. Well, in, in a typical film shoot, you're not filming more than 15 minutes anyway, but sometimes we just let the camera run until the actor gets the line right. And so let's try that again from the beginning and then we won't cut it. We'll just keep it going. So we have really long video files and really long audio files. Um, but sometimes it's easier to do it that way um, just because of the momentum and all that. But if you're using a DSLR, it's not gonna work. 
So if you were using a DSLR to film like a drama performance, then you ha you can only do 15 minutes at a time. Um, I was looking uh, like a wedding video too. If you want to just let the camera run, you can't use a DSLR. You got to use a camcorder or something um, that will continue to record even because uh, after 15 minutes, like this auto off thing, okay? Um, the storage gets huge with the DSLR. So that's why they limit it to 15 minutes because if you're dealing with that much storage, then it's a little sketchy, okay? So it has limited recording time. Um, and of course, just like most cameras, bad audio. It's got a little microphone built into the camera. So it's like usually poopy, okay? All right. Um, without the camera, so you can actually put an external microphone on it. Yeah, some, some DSLR, well, some camera, most cameras will come with like an XLR input which are the mic cables, the three prong mic cables. But with DSLRs, you have to get adapters and things like that to use a nice camera if you wanna go right into the, to the um, camera. But usually those adapters are crappy too. So you'll get like hisses and buzzes and things like that. And so it doesn't usually work. So it's always better to just do a dual system where you're recording your audio separately from your film and then what you do in post, you sync the audio with the film. So it's good to record the audio on your camera, even though it's crappy, because you need something to line up the good audio with. That's called syncing. So you're gonna sync that audio later. So uh, no matter what camera you use, you should always consider a separate audio system. Okay, and then of course the last one, the one we like, is basically a digital cinema camera, okay? Most Hollywood films are filmed on what are called red cameras, and uh, that will give you that cinematic look. And a lot of it is about lenses too, cinematic lenses and things like that will make that, will give it that movie feel, that movie vibe but a lot of people don't like it because it, it does take away from the quality of the film. And, it, and it, um, a lot of people like that nice raw digital um, appearance where it feels like it's live, like you're watching it live, but it's not very cinematic. Okay, so um, those are the different kind of cameras. Uh, there's some other things that you should consider. <clears throat> so as you're recording the footage and you're importing the footage, so recording, and importing footage, like right now, like a, I, uh, I'm, I'm filming my classes so I can post these videos online so people at home can see them and things like that. Um, I don't realize, or I have to remind myself every time of how much time it takes. Like right now, these, these shots are on my camera. I could just upload them to YouTube right now. It takes a little bit to upload, but um, I could do it. Um, but I wanna edit it. So what I do is I bring it over to my computer. So it takes some time to get over to my computer. And then on my computer, I bring it into my editing tool. I'm, I use Adobe Premiere. So on that, I will, I will edit it, which doesn't take too long, but then I'll export it. And if I want it to be okay quality, the exporting is gonna take maybe a half an hour sometimes. Then after half an hour, then I have to upload it to YouTube. So on Friday, I spent all day just dealing with Thursday's lessons. So it takes a while. Did you have your hand raised? I was just asking, how hard is it to use Adobe uh, Premiere? It's, it, the learning, I mean, there's so many things you could do with Premiere, but if you wanted to just do some basic stuff, it's pretty easy to jump in. Okay. And Google is your best friend, right? Like you can just, if you don't know how to do something, like, oh, how do you, how do you do that? And that you could YouTube it or just Google it and, and it's, it's really easy. And there's so many people who 
upload videos on how to do everything in Premiere. So whenever we get stuck or we don't know how to do a certain effect or something, let me just Google it and it's right there. It's pretty easy. Um, but it's costly. Uh, we, we have the student slash staff discounts. We get $20 a month, gives us the whole suite, the whole um, uh, creative suite. So we get Illustrator, we get Photoshop, we get After Effects, we get animation tools, we get all this stuff. But Two Roads um, pays for my license, so I, I get to use it. And I, it's, it pays for two of my two licenses. So I use it on my laptop and I use it on my studio computer. Did you finish? Yeah, that was, I messed up three times because of the, <laughs> the phone's mechanics is so weird. Yeah. All right, let me see. Oh, my phone. There it is, 100%. Good job. Thank you. Very good. Okay, so as you're recording and um, importing stuff, there's some things you want to consider. Like when you're recording, it's nice to look at, uh, to consider some depth of field, okay? Now, um, depth of field is basically how deep your focus is. Okay, now, um, I think I can do this. I think I can do this. So depth of field. So how, base, if you want a shallow depth of field, it's how deep your focus is. So for example, if I'm focusing on something right here, then everything else is blurry, okay? So a shallow depth of field will just focus on that Maybe the, the depth is about this much, so it'll only this stuff will only be in focus, everything else will be blurry. Okay, that's cool, that's cinematic. So depth of field, I'm gonna show you um, a video here. Let's see if we can do it. All right, this is just some photography. Okay, so here's some images for understanding depth of field for beginners. If you want to look at this, you can. I'll try to remember to put this inside um, the assignment or on Schoology somewhere. But if you see there, I mean, you can kind of see pretty far in there and it, most of it's in focus, but it starts to get a little out of focus at the end. Um, let me show you just some examples of these two things. So see how the photo on the left is a shallow depth of field. So the, see how the flowers in the background are a little blurry. It looks a little more cinematic, a little more professional. That looks like it was shot with a flip phone, right? The one on the right. So that's the thing with phones is most people like point and shoot cameras, you wanna just get the focus you don't want to worry about focus. You just want to take it as quick as you can, right? So they cameras will typically have will not have a lot of like iPhones and stuff like that will not have a lot of depth of field options because it just wants you to get it done. And what iPhone does is it has this autofocus, so it looks for a face and tries to focus on it. Okay, that's a pretty cool shot. Shallow depth of field. I don't know what that is. Is that a bat or something? What? I don't know what it is. That's a, I believe a bat. swan. <laughs> it looked like a bat. It was a, it was a swan. Oh, I, I can't see from here, I guess. Oh. <laughs> Here's a cool shot. So see that? See how it's like a little bit of depth of field, but even farther here, that's a really shallow depth of field. That's pretty cool. That's nice. It's a nice that's shot a there. That's a bird. It's not a bat. It's a bird. Okay. We really wanted to <laughs> so this is nice. If you wanted more of the scenery of something, then you don't really want a shallow depth of field, right? You want to see the, the vast expanse of, the, of wherever you're at. If you're taking pictures of beautiful landscape, you don't want a shallow depth of field. Even though it looks cool, you want to see it because that's cool. All right? So that's depth of field. Um, 
There's a cool little video here if we want to watch it. I think it's worth watching. Where's my mouse? Writing's not that easy, but Grammarly can help. Grammarly! This sentence is grammatically correct, but it's wordy and hard to read. It undermines the writer's message and... Okay, this is a cool little, just a quickie. In this tutorial, we will talk about... I like this guy's accent, so... ...to amateur filmmakers, the shallow depth of field. But is it curse or blessing? Most DSLR filmmakers are glad with the shallow depth of field because they can create some stunning images like major Hollywood studios. But especially beginners are often lost in the DSLR world because they don't know how to get the depth of field. And if they do, they don't know how to use it and how to control it. First off, you need a lens with a wide open aperture, let's say f1.4. As you can see, you have a lovely shallow depth of field, but at f8, you can clearly see the background and the effect isn't working anymore. Of course, the depth of field can be very nice. It almost doesn't matter what you're filming, it will look professional. Just but you shouldn't cool. overdo uh, that, because not every shot has to be in such a low focal area. In general, it makes sense to shoot wide open when you're shooting a close-up of a person and don't want that the audience knows what's going on in the background. Here are a few examples. This was shot with an expensive high quality lens. But if you're shooting with a cheap lens that has a low aperture, you will get a lot of blur. But the things that are in focus aren't really sharp because of the lens quality. You shouldn't shoot too wide open if you're filming a big crowd from the front or above. Why? Because almost nothing will be in focus and the image won't be really sharp. Here is an example. You can clearly see that the video taken at f8 looks better and sharper because more people are in focus. This brings us to the next point. How to control the depth of field. If someone walks from the background of your video into the front, and you want to have them in focus all the time, you have to pull the focus ring of the lens. If you shoot wide open at f1.4, it is nearly impossible to follow the person instantly, even for professionals. To make that easier, different manufacturers design follow focus systems for DSLRs. But it is still hard to control focus. We recommend that you think about if you really need a shallow depth of field in every shot. Honestly, have you ever seen a Hollywood movie where every shot is like that? You need to mix it in a nice way, otherwise the audience will go crazy. Back to the question. Is it curse or blessing? For us it is a blessing, because you can create a look that is still special to most people, but it isn't always easy. What do you think? Leave a comment. Okay, so I'd love to do, if we can connect um, I'm going to attempt to connect to... Good grammar and spelling are important. Okay. But if you want to write essays that inspire, messages... So what I'd love to do is just show you a quick example. And maybe we will... Uh, see if we can do this on here. Can I flip it in mid-section? No, maybe not. Sit down. Okay, isn't that what cool? It doesn't matter what you're filming, that just looks cool, doesn't it? See how Audrey and Asher are out of focus? But then oh, here's a cool shot, this is called a pull focus. If I click on Audrey, isn't that cool how it does that? So this is called a pull focus. A lot of times when, like, let's say, um, cheap amateur video tripod guy here, um, like Audrey's talking, just say, why don't you say this, Audrey, say, why, where are you going? Don't leave me. <laughs> where are you going? Don't leave me. Let me focus on microphone stand. I just need to leave. I just need some time. Blip, 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 blip. 
Okay. And then it goes back to Audrey. She's like, no. 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 <laughs> okay. So th there's power in that, right? And there's a, it's, there's cool pull, pull focus, but see how it's very challenging on an iPhone. Okay. So this is a cool thing where like a subject comes into focus. So they're out of focus and they come in. So come right up to the camera and give me a mean look. <laughs> I can't do it. You're so mean. Okay. Um, so you just double tap to lock it? So you press and hold to lock it. Oh, okay. So if you are focusing with your iPhone, if you have an iPhone, you just press and hold and then it'll, you'll see AF lock. So yeah. Is this homework? Are we supposed to do like a short movie or something? No, not yet, but it will be. Cause, so cause I do, I, we already filmed, we filmed a movie um, back um, uh, where I'm from. We made a movie with our friends and I can just send you that. Nice. Oh, well, I'd love to see it anyway. It's, it's really funny. Okay. <laughs> So um, you can do a lot with an iPhone, like you can make it work, but obviously it's not ideal for those cool shots and those cool, but if you're close enough to an object, there'll be some good depth of field. So it doesn't matter what kind of camera you have, if you're close enough to an object, it's everything is gonna be blurry except that object, okay? Those are, um, anyway, so uh, moving on, when you're filming or when you're importing, the biggest mistake is, oh, we got to get this scene done. We're, the, we're losing daylight. We're going to lose. We're going to miss our opportunity. No, don't rush, okay? You won't be happy with your results most of the time. You'll come home and you'll look at your footage and you're like, oh, we should have taken our time, okay? So... When you're filming, you should also take notes because in the editing process, if you're the one editing or if you give it to someone, they're going to love you or hate you. If there's like seven takes of the same scene, I'm like, okay, do I have to watch every single take or do you have some notes for me? Like, okay, don't even bother looking at the end of take three. That's poop. Okay, get rid of that. So my favorite takes, usually the best takes are the ones toward the end, right? They've had plenty of practice in the last take, maybe six or seven. Usually we say, okay, that was great. That was perfect. Let's do it again. So we it, two good takes is usually pretty standard. So take notes on set so your editor knows what to edit and to look for, and they have your opinion. Um, the editor really respects the cinematographer's opinion and the DP, the director of photography. Um, because they know what they're doing. And usually they go, oh, there's a pull focus on this take. The pull focus didn't work, I didn't get it. Um, it's, there's an art, there's a skill of pull focus where if you don't get it right on the face, it doesn't work, okay? All right, so um, back up, back up, back up. So make backups of backups. Don't. Don't, uh, don't feel bad about making multiple backups, okay? All right, um, we are gonna talk about the verbiage on set. So maybe I'll quiz you on this on Thursday to see if you can remember. First thing that we say is quiet on set. That means we're about to start. So the director, when the the director calls quiet on set, be quiet. The second thing is roll sound or sound speed. Um, we're gonna do, or roll camera, we're gonna, we're gonna do both. We're gonna do roll, uh, usually um, you're rolling camera first, it doesn't matter. Roll sound or roll audio. On our uh, set, we would say audio, and I would say rolling, that's how you respond. The response is rolling, or sometimes you would say sound speed. Where that comes from is actual tape recorders that um, when you press record on a tape recorder, it takes a minute for it to get up to the speed of recording. So, and then it's recording. So you would say, yes, it's at its, it's at its speed. So uh, I would say rolling, roll sound, rolling, or sound rolling, okay, to be more specific. 
roll uh, so then it's roll film a roll camera or camera speed roll camera or camera speed rolling okay all right and then we've got one more before the two that you know one more is slate or um we call it we, we call it slate on set but um or clapper basically that little clapper thing so we would say slate or slates or clapper or usually we would say slate and then we'd say the the scene scene 1a take one or take two or whatever um, why is that important to see and to hear the psh? Because it, well, it, it's like, it's going to drown out all the other noise. So it's like, you know what I mean? Like if it was just like an action, yeah. you kind of hear like the background noise a little bit because people are settling down. But yeah. You, the clap, it's kind of like, you need the clap and you can see the clap in the audio form, in the waveforms, you see a nice line. Yeah. And that's what we like in post-production to line up the audio that we're recording separately if we're smart. We line the audio up right with that little line and it's a nice little line we can line up. What were you gonna say? Oh, I'm just saying that uh, I guess people see stuff slower than hearing stuff and stuff yeah. and stuff and stuff. Yeah, and you can visually see where it's clapping too. So you can visually line up the audio with the clapper as well, okay? Um, but you, if, if, you're not, if you're not recording audio on your camera, then you definitely need to see the clapper, see where it claps, okay? Um, but if you have two audio forms, you can just line up the nice little line, okay? And then the last two, what, do you, what does the director say when he's ready to go? Action. Action. And cut. And then cut. And then, okay? And that's a wrap. And that's a wrap. Yeah, that's always fun to say, especially at the end of the the production. That's a wrap.